Hello, and welcome to the Optimized Equine Podcast. In this episode, Vanessa and I discuss our processes for assessing a horse for the first time. We emphasize the importance of understanding each horse's needs and beginning at their own unique starting point. We also discuss the art of engaging with different types of horses in order to build tolerance, understanding, and trust for the greater good of the horse. And with that, enjoy the show. So, Vanessa, question for you. Okay. I wanted to know about your uh, kind of your process when you have a new a new horse for the first time, and this is a little bit of a two part question. So, uh, part A. When you have a horse that's like uh, someone's coming to you for maintenance, I want Schnookums to make sure they're feeling their best and we want to have an appointment every however many weeks and that kind of, you know, situation for the first time. And also someone coming to you with more of a specific problem, concern, something they want to fix. Oh, they're right hind is they're off or my vet says or something like that okay yeah i'm thinking already of two really good kind of examples to to give you to showcase that difference between maintenance and we have a issue we really need to address um so my process when i first see a horse is obviously i'm going to get all the information from the owner that i can it's really valuable um Horse owners don't get enough credit, I think, in that they really know their horse as well. They they observe them. You know, some people are almost OCD in observing their horse's behaviors, but that's actually really good information for me um, as an osteopath. Um, so I will, you know, obviously look at the horse, just assess kind of posturally what I can. There are many things we can observed by just looking at how they stand, their musculature, their conformation, um, their feet, their shoeing. For instance, if they're special shoeing, then I always want to ask, you know, well, what's the reason for this? Um, and I get information from the owner about the frequency of their shoeing, the frequency of their dental, um, specific issues they're having with the horse. Um, Sometimes we we go into, okay, um, do you have your saddle professionally fitted or not? Um, oftentimes that will come up though more in the evaluation process if we find a lot of soreness, for instance, in the saddle outline area. Um, but I wanna know what the person does with their horse. I wanna know the history of the horse, um, how long they've had the horse, um, if there are any past injuries or um, disease, illness, anything that the vet has had to treat. I want to know about that. I want to know about traumas, even if it's just like a pullback that the owner didn't think was a big deal. Um, so I, I try to ask as many questions as I can to get as much information as I can. Then in the actual evaluation and assessment, I do a combination of what I was taught in the Masterson method and my osteopathy training. So in the Masterson method, we're taught to go in and palpate the horse um, along areas of the body, um, such as the back, the, the saddle outline area, the glutes, you know, the hind end, uh, pole, TMJ, um, around the shoulder. That's going to tell me what the tissue, how reactive the tissue is, because a palpation is just me kind of running my fingers along tissue to see if there's a reaction there. So the reaction may look like a flinch or pulling away. And all it means is that tissue is reactive. We're talking about the skin, the muscle, um, the, the fascia. You, you want to press hard enough to get a reaction if there's going to be one, but then you want to lighten up if you get a big reaction. So sometimes specific areas that the horse is reactive in can point me towards a potential primary issue um, creating compensation patterns like you know maybe the the feet are a little long and a, about to be redone trimmed or reshod so oftentimes horses will become a little 
are sensitive in the, the girth area. Um, we call that the hoof point area. Um, sometimes if there's a saddle fit issue, that that's going to keep coming up every time you evaluate the horse, even if you've already worked on the horse. So along the actual spine of the horse, on the sides of, of the spine, again, where the saddle outline would be, those things may point to that. For instance, a lot of pole or uh, TMJ sensitivity may point towards a dental issue, for instance. So I like to get an idea of reactivity. Now, what I'd like to clarify and differentiate between is re reactivity and restriction. So when I'm going through and I'm palpating and seeing if there's a reaction somewhere, that's not the same as testing range of motion. So I want to then go and literally test every single joint. We were trained to test every single joint for motion. And that is going to then inform me even more of this overall picture of the horse. The patterns that the horse presents in his body tell me so many things. It's not magic. It's, it's anatomy and physiology, okay? But I'm going to get an idea of how sensitive that horse is uh, just in his musculoskeletal system to touch, for instance, with the Masterson evaluation then the specific patterns that the osteopathic evaluation is going to show me can help me actually have an idea of any potential primary issues internally that are going on. So um, not to just blab it all out, but if I'm working on a horse and I find, um, let's say, a certain part of the spine locked up in the same way. So say right behind the withers around your thoracic 10, 11, 12 vertebra arc. Say I find those all kind of in an extension so they can't flex there. And I also find that there's a little bit of a bend. So say I, 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 can, I can kind of rotate and bend those vertebra to the left, but I can't to the right. Okay, that's some information because that part of the spine is where nerves are entering and exiting that supply my my stomach and some of my foregut. So I, I think about that. But then I have to find other patterns in the body that tell me that the nervous system has an excitation. Um, and so again, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of it, but say I find that Say I find a left shoulder because you you always do with um, uh, stomach issues uh, or or gut issues because of something called the phrenic nerve. So see, it's all physiology and anatomy. But say I find a shoulder. Say I restricted. Okay, that's what I mean by that. Say I find that shoulder is restricted, um, and maybe even it's painful. Maybe even it's painful to to test the motion of that shoulder. And then I find that part of the spine, and then I have to find some other things. But then I'm going to turn to the owner and I'm going to say, is your horse girthy or senshi? Do you see any obvious signs of gut disturbance? Do they seem worried a lot? Um, do they do they seem anxious? Um, do you trailer, their, trailer them a lot? Do they get shown a lot? How are they managed? How are they fed? You know, diet's another one that, that I kind of uh, try to ask about in the beginning. But if I'm finding these patterns in the body that are screaming, gut may be the thing, gut may be the thing. Um, then I want to then further explore with the owner, uh, ask some questions to, to try to kind of either confirm or deny in a sense what I'm finding, if that all makes sense. So after I do that, um, I'm going to go through and I'm going to treat the horse. So I'm going to um, get those things moving that are stuck. And then there's um, oftentimes, especially with the backs and fascial things that I can do to try to alleviate some of the reactivity if I happen to find that. Um, and then afterwards, I always tell the owner, um, please don't ride your horse the day of or the day after of, of treatment because you want to give the body time to integrate those changes. So it takes time and it takes controlled motion to do that. So then I also say hand walk the horse. Sometimes when you turn a horse out, they just stand there. They don't do anything. So they're not actually moving to integrate anything. Or you turn them out and they're nuts so. So we don't want that because then they're feeling good. And then, you know, they might twerk something because they're feeling so good. And, and, and you're setting them up to 
uh, kind of uh, move things that maybe haven't moved in a while. And then it's, you know, and then you kind of take a few steps yeah. back. We don't so, go very far with all those. Uh, we don't want to go too far with the movement and we want it to be controlled. So like what I love to do is say like if I'm working, if, we're, if we have a, a shared client go, okay, I did my job. Now you go to Tamara and do some really good groundwork exercises over the next two days to help them feel their body, know where their body is because they have to move it to know that they can do it different. And you have to kind of reset to a new normal through, again, controlled motion and time. Now, if you have a horse that has a lot going on, um, uh, a lot of um, tension and restriction in the body, um, or there's a specific issue that um, the owner has tried to investigate, but they're not getting a lot of answers. It may be something as simple as you've got a lot of conflicting fascial holes and draws on the body that it's going to make the horse look imbalanced or maybe even asymmetrical, but they're not, but they're not off, right? They're not, they're not um, in pain in a particular area where the vet needs to step in and, and treat that. But there's just so many different pools on that body that they don't look right. So, you know, sometimes it's that sort of thing that we're dealing with and we have to kind of keep peeling and peeling and peeling. In that instance, I would want to see the horse more frequently, like once a month, once every three months. But if it's a horse that is competing or maybe it's just a, a trail horse, you know, the owner just wants to go and enjoy the horse, but everything's kind of steady and stable. We found that new normal to where the compensation patterns I'm finding are what I would expect. Then we might go, okay, anywhere from six weeks to three months. Also, depending on how much you use that horse how old the horse is, how much wear and tear that horse already has. Um, I want to share something with you um, kind of on the other end of the spectrum. Um, I had a wonderful uh, veterinarian in New Mexico refer a client to me that she was also working with, and she was incredible. Um, and she thought this horse had sciatica which is something that people talk about, but it's a little bit trickier with horses because obviously they can't tell you, yeah, that leg felt feels weak, or I have a lot of pain in my gluteal muscle. Well, you can palpate and find those things, but um, if it's like a weakness, for instance, or in this case, what was happening was this mare every so often would get almost what looked like kind of a spasm of all of the structures along the back side of one of her hind legs. So she would toe stab. She couldn't, she couldn't um, relax and stretch all that to get the heel to the ground. It looked like she had an injury to one of her like uh, superficial or flexor tendons or suspensory. It looked like that because she's going around toe stabbing that it would be kind of this intermittent episodic kind of thing that would happen and I mean this owner had done everything she had diagnosed I'm sorry she had done diagnostics with her vet on everything radiographs nuclear scan ultrasound and they weren't finding anything definitive to explain that so we got that mare to where she wasn't doing that anymore and it was sciatica and that veterinarian and I worked together and she was amazing. Um, we had to treat that horse. I was treating her once or twice a week. The owner actually moved her down to Tucson for the summer so that I could get to her at least once a week. Now I couldn't do a full session on her, which is normally what I like to do. You wanna work on all the parts and pieces. If I just work on the head, then the hind end may throw that off. You know, if you compartmentalize what you're working on, oftentimes those things come back because you have to kind of hit everything, right? So on her, though, I had to work like that because I, I 
she couldn't handle a whole session. But what I did was I really concentrated on her craniosacral system. Um, she also had shivers. Um, I worked on her hind end a lot. What we thought happened was if you looked at just kind of the structure of her um, sacrum and coccyx, which is the tail vertebra in her tail, it looked like she had sat back on that and kind of pushed her sacrum up like that. Just, just looking at it. And I also was fortunate in that my osteopathy professor, one of the professors at the time was able to really help me with that. So he gets a lot of credit to you for kind of, you know, pointing some of those things out. So essentially she had a trauma on her hind end that positionally threw some of that lumbar and SI area out of whack. And because of that, I think it really compressed and irritated that sciatic nerve. Mm -hmm. And then you get these, these episodes of, of her, like I said, toe stabbing. So I did, you know, osteopathy. I, I structurally adjusted those areas. I did a lot of stretching. I did a lot of fascial stuff. Um, did a lot of stuff with the dura matter, the craniosacral system and Three months later, she's not doing it. But it took kind of picking away at that almost weekly, which I told the owner at the onset, I said, I don't normally do that because I want to give the body a chance to um, do something. So you want to set the body up and then you kind of want to see what it can do on its own. But in this case, we needed to really hit it hard, you know, and every week. And so... That's just an example of, oh, hi, Kesto. That's the cat. He's, we're, we like to play. Um, anyways, that's an example of, of a horse that I saw, like I said, nearly every week that had a very specific issue that we ended up kind of normalizing. So the other thing I want to say, too, that we've talked about before is what the, the Masterson evaluation and the osteopathy evaluation helped me determine is are the compensation patterns that I'm observing and presenting themselves is that normal is that what I would expect so in osteopathy when we find things that don't fit together so like I said there's like a conflicting draw and pull on structures we call that a decompensation so those decompensations, they don't feel good, right? They hurt and they create a dysfunctional motion in the joint that has all these pulls on it that over time is going to give you structural damage. So that's another big thing that I think in particular, the osteopathy training, uh, I, I don't know where else this is being taught, but figuring out what's typical normal compensatory patterns and what's abnormal tension d comp uh i can't even talk i can't even say it d compensation d compensatory patterns huge absolutely huge because you can go work on a horse before a show for instance and you can just adjust a few things that are going to help that horse but it's what you adjust that's going to make the difference. You might go in and adjust the, the kind of typical normal tension patterns. You, you might go in and adjust a few things that are affecting that. And then you've destabilized the horse because remember we have a show in two days. So that horse needs to have some arbor, some tension that they've been carrying to be able to go out and do whatever you're asking them to do, right? And it not, and then not be so um, thrown off because, you know, you're kind of throwing a monkey wrench in their normal patterns that, that then they're going around and not really organizing, right? Or maybe they're too relaxed and they're, there's a, there's a famous story, someone in Masterson one time said she worked on this pony right before a jumping competition and the and the then the pony's like going around like yawning and like you know is like too schnockered to really do the job right 
But if I, and, and I don't normally like to do that. Okay. I, I don't normally like to work on a horse right before, before they go show or have a big trail ride or competition or something. Cause I don't want to destabilize them. Also, you don't want to be the one that changes things. And then the horse goes differently. Uh, maybe not in a good way. And then the horse doesn't perform well. And then you're the last person to touch the horse and then you get blamed for it. But you're <laughs> right. Um, but, yeah, but there's, there's, uh, a huge, huge majority of horse people would be like, I'm going to get the service at the show or before the show or for the show or whatever. Right. Um, they would think that would be the right or proactive or best thing to do. Right. I, I do but think there is a difference between, um, practitioners, like, I feel like there's practitioners that are like making changes, like making things better, uh, whether there's a problem that needs fixed or like you're saying, just making that horse more optimal and longer lasting and all this stuff. But that takes making changes and that right then then the feel good. Right. And yeah. I, and I think, you know, to your point, I think that a lot of people that do work on the show circuit, for instance, in that capacity have really figured out what is too much, you know, like Jim actually used to work on horses on the hunter jumper circuit, um, years before he, uh, you know, came up with his well he was doing his own method then but before he started sharing that with everybody else and he didn't do so much though that it destabilized the horse you know what i mean well and let's face it there is a lot of tension in these performance things like that is right you, you know no it's not the time to go make big changes exactly exactly and um, and yeah, it's fitting because there's so much tension to be uh, let go of, quite frankly, you know. Right. The just just even the show environment causes. Right. So so those horses did phenomenal. Right. Um, but but if I could just say one more thing about the the decompensation patterns, if you go in and you just adjust a few things that are working in a dysfunctional way, that horse goes good. So it's all about knowing what to take and what to leave. And you really have to know your patterns, your fascial patterns, and and put all those parts and pieces together and know if there are potential primary issues involved, like teeth, feet, saddle fit, in order to know how to treat that horse, either to, like you said, kind of make them feel good, just relax them a little so they, they can go out and do what they need to do. Or yeah, we're we're going for for the big stuff here. We're we're going to make some big changes, and in that case, it takes time. It takes peeling the onion. Um, it it's usually not going to happen in one session. Not to say it can't, but again, you've got a lot of other primary issues to consider, um, and you've got you know potentially structural damage or a lot of wear and tear to consider that you're only going to get that horse so good in a certain way um so you really have to know the whole picture of what you're dealing with and you have to be you know it's not about again we talked about with like um the teeth and cosmetic floating like floating every horse the same way it's the same way with the body work you're not gonna go and work on on each horse the same way you would be doing a disservice to the horse to do that you have to look at that individual horse and you have to figure out what's going to be an appropriate approach and treatment protocol for that horse. And oftentimes that's going to involve the rest of the team, right? So that lady that, that cared so much about her horse and she hauled that horse down here, we pulled the shoes. We just let her go barefoot for a while. We changed the diet. We took out um, a lot of uh, inflammation in the diet. So it wasn't just one thing it was everything the team approach it always comes back to that team team approach so what yeah so what is what's your kind of process when you're meeting a horse for the first time um well i would say the uh the universal priority um no matter what i 
and meeting the horse for or what the horse is uh you know what the goal is i need that horse to be able to to look and, and have a conversation if you will all my air quotes imagine if you if you listen to this it didn't see all of my air quotes it'd be so sad but anyway, it would be sad <laughs> you're really missing out if you can't see all my air quotes but anyway um <laughs> I need the horse to be able to engage. You could say, look at me or have a conversation or you could say it like so many different ways. But at the end of the day, I want the horse to be able to engage with me. Uh, and I will say, I would like that to be able to happen at a standstill because some horses, when you first meet them, that's not necessarily uh, an easy option. So if the horse can't stand still, that's going to be something that's going to be a... Uh, a pretty good priority for me to create because I think if a horse can't stand still, then we've, we are lacking the ability to kind of reset and we're certainly lacking the ability to, uh, learn things in a, in a productive way. <laughs> yeah. I uh, get the horse to look at me, engage with me at a standstill, ideally if possible, um, to have that as like a reset. I, I'll call it park. I want that horse to be able to park. Now, I have to be careful with that word because I guess that could also mean like park my uh, saddle brine horse or something. But that's not, right. <laughs> that's not what I mean. In fact, right. The opposite. <laughs> um, so I want that horse to be able to park and have a conversation with me and if need be relax. Now, clearly, there's the other side of that spectrum where the horse is a bump on a log like they are just so stationary and not really present now those horses mm -hmm. often look at you but they won't really engage with you like you do yeah you know it takes a lot to make any kind of change in them because they're just kind of there um so certainly the way i get a horse to engage with me varies a lot just like all the different personalities of horses out there there's like a, a number of different ways i might get there but that has to be a first priority because if i'm gonna teach them anything um or teach their own or something we, we all have to be able to kind of get to this learning state of mind where we're not nervous or blocking you out or you know, let's say very distracted. Some horses may have uh, a good intention of trying to do your lesson or do it is what you want to do, but they're really easily distracted, a little squirrel brain action. So it doesn't take much in there, here, there, and everywhere. So I'm going to teach that horse to be able to uh, increase their tolerance of staying put and taking a breath and that kind of a thing. Go uh ahead. -huh. There's some horses, some of those more stationary type horses, um, they might have no problem engaging with you in when you're parked, when you're standing still. And, and for me, park is going to involve rebalancing. So if they're standing really relaxed, I'm going to start to work on just shifting their weight around and getting them to, to carry their weight even just at a standstill, carry their weight a little more balanced on their four legs. Cause usually if they're super relaxed or blocking you out, they're really into those front legs and kind of leaned into the chin. So that's going to be a thing we're working on. And usually in that process, I will find out, okay, this horse is genuinely just a quiet horse or <laughs> that horse actually is kind of a, uh, blocking conversations or blocking you could say the ability to influence them um so those i'm sure you feel that <laughs> in, in what you're doing <laughs> I'm sure you get that uh, well it's in it's interesting and if, if i may i love okay so window of tolerance is a psychological term okay. talking about being in this um your nervous system in this particular window where you can learn where you can process where you are in your body where you can have a conversation so you know ramped up would be that hyper arousal that would be the horse that that can't stand still the hypo arousal will be that horse you're talking about where they're like you said blocking conversation and so i just think it's so funny sometimes how you can take kind of these glimmers from uh 
psychology and how humans behave. And, you know, we all have nervous systems that have to, to balance within uh, the autonomic nervous system in particular. So finding balance within that state of on one extreme, hyper arousal, sympathetic, fight or flight, and then the other end of the spectrum, which we also don't want to tune in too extreme to, which would be hypo arousal, um, kind of dull, not reactive, um, too much in that relaxation state, but to a point where you're numbed out, right? Not able to communicate. It, it's funny how I just feel like some of that translates, <laughs> you know, it's kind of cross species. In yes. And I am no, uh, no psychologist. You're a horse psychologist. <laughs> oh, no, you're a horse psychologist. A horse whisperer. Uh, get it right. <laughs> Sorry. Would you rather be a magician? I mean, I said at one point we weren't magicians, but it is Halloween is approaching, so perhaps we should embrace. Yeah. Um, oh, but what I could say was I think we all, I think at this point, it's kind of common knowledge that a human who doesn't engage doesn't move much is always in like a super relaxed posture doesn't really ever get into an athletic posture or do much i think it's pretty common knowledge that that person runs into uh possibly physical health issues circulation issues depression issues you know and i think that's all true in horses too again i'm no doctor i'm sure some doctor can uh, put all that together for us but I think it's pretty clear you don't want a horse too much in that uh, state of mind all the time and unable to get out of it. Clearly, there's right. downsides in many directions for that. <laughs> you want balance. And, and so, like, how do, you, how do you engage a horse that's on the other end of that spectrum that's a little more dull and non-communicative? I personally find that kind of horse to be more challenging it's funny because it used to be the other way around in uh in my old way of horsing before changing things up i liked what i would now call dull horses but i also just kind of rode around pushing them along all the time and it I was blessed enough at that time to be riding horses that were very kind very kind warm-blooded horses that let us do such things you know um and so anyway, now at that time, I would have said that like a hotter horse, an Arabian or a thoroughbred was harder. Right. And now I would say in a way, a sensitive horse is easier for me, but that's because I have learned how to be so much more sensitive. You know what I'm saying? So I, I do think it kind of depends on uh, where you're coming from and what your uh, desired results are. Um, so now because I am not interested in, uh, you know, electrocuting my horse or uh, prying oh. along uh, to get them going. <laughs> um, now I think I have to be a little more creative in getting that kind of horse engaged. And I think the reason they, well, maybe I won't say the reason, but, but the way that horse got there definitely influences how you're going to get them out. That is one situation where I think the... Uh, the positive reinforcement can be, if, if done well, can be incredibly, incredibly helpful. If a horse has kind of been uh, drilled on and has decided that humans don't have a lot of good things to offer them. Yeah. You know, really, uh, a really good way to get them kind of awake to the training process. Again, yeah. not the only way. Um, some horses I find just need to, um, learn about the right kind of motion. Some of them have not ever done any kind of motion that feels good to them when they're with a person, whether that's ridden or otherwise, where you could say lunging or with someone on their back, they've just kind of, let's say it's a really downhill quarter horse and some downhill quarter horses, whether it's their start 
or it's just their natural athleticism or whatever, they figure out sort of on their own how to be athletic despite being kind of downhill. You know? And then uh, others don't learn it for whatever reason. It could be a million different reasons, whether it was their training or whatever. They don't learn just on their own how to kind of pick themselves up and go do something athletic yet because it's a kind soul they get ridden anyway they don't buck people out you know so so they they let people ride them anyway well they go around being ridden in this way that it never feels good and fully dysfunctional posture right like no yeah they're just surviving (laughs) that horse is not yet in physical pain which often i think they are in more physical pain than their riders realize um because it doesn't present as like a three-legged lamb or something. I don't think they realize how stiff and sore they often are, but that's a, yeah. Let's say they're not even yet in pain. They still don't think it's fun because they're kind of always getting, it's like they're off balance being like thrown off balance. Right. Yeah. Just, uh, if I am, almost tripping and falling we all we've all been there we're like walking along and you're like oh that like spot before you almost fall it's like flailing different directions and stuff like that they kind of feel like that in my opinion it doesn't necessarily present to us that way because they have four legs so they're still on the ground they're still upright Mm -hmm. yeah like all over the place as far as their balance goes in their head they don't tell you that because they've just got used to it (laughs) but yeah very fun so anyway so i find yeah this is if they haven't been like abused (laughs) if they haven't been mercilessly drilled on for some purpose sometimes they're just kind of like that and dull because it hasn't felt that good and you can kind of show them a better way of moving that's more free and fluid and sometimes that's all they need and sometimes it's fun and they become light and things just kind of get better and better and that's that's the best case scenario all right other times they got a little bit that way because they did not enjoy whatever training or job they had and kind of learned to go somewhere else in their head and that's definitely trickier because you've got to you got to draw the mind out of a place that it's just kind of somewhere else. It's in la-la land a little bit, and it's easy for, for it to go back there. So, but yeah, where the creativity comes into it, I would say uh, I'm going to start with, in all cases, I'm going to start with, let's go move around and find balanced motion that's kind of effortless. Let, ha- however we need to get there, let's find that and uh, and see if that takes care of of things a lot of times that it either takes care of things on its own or the things that make that not possible are the things that need taken care of you follow yeah <laughs> it's either gonna work or it's gonna present what needs to- uh, and, and uncover almost in a sense other issues that need to be taken care of it just reminds me of like i've been doing some dance classes recently that have been a lot of fun um but but that connection between like your brain and what your body is doing feels really good and especially if you are able to i think as a horse move in in a in a way that is like self-carriage so, so carrying yourself, you know, and if you are habitually being ridden, um, just carrying someone around, I mean, that rider is essentially just riding the spine, if that makes sense, as opposed to a horse that's really carrying himself, he or she, they are going to lift their back because they're using their butt because they're engaging their hind end and they're able to initiate that motion almost like a bull whip is how the horse's spine kind of moves so you're either just like you said kind of like an octopus just like getting along 
right balancing however you can or that horse is actually carrying themselves and carrying you which feels good and that's really cool that you use that that to kind of um connect them to their body and either like you said that works or then it just shows other things maybe truly physical things that maybe i need to come in get mobilized so that then they can move their body in a more functional way mm -hmm. you know and that whole piece you're talking about carrying carrying their rider and i think horses that naturally learn how to carry truly a rider don't have all the problems and there is a huge chunk of horses that are just pulling just pulling right and on, you know some people are aware and some people are absolutely not aware that the way their horse is going is kind of, I mean, I'll just call it dysfunctional. It is dysfunctional. It doesn't mean they're lame. It doesn't mean they can't go out and do a job for you. But it's right. like, hey, it's, you know, it's causing so many things pe that people don't realize are related. They just think it's normal, just normal. But actually, it's because they're pulling and they've been pulling for the last 10 years. Um <laughs> Yeah. Well, and over time that will show some, some issues somewhere, yeah. right? You know, and you're talking about if, if the horse is, is one of these quarter horses that's already built down, downhill, then how much strain is being put on that, um, thoracic inlet area where the last neck vertebra, the first thoracic, you've got your sternum, you got your first rib, you got a lot of important nerve structures there. Um, that's just going to insult that. And over time, the body will develop some issue somewhere. Um, yeah. <laughs> so anyway, we went down a rabbit hole on that one a little bit about horse backs. But anyway, um, so let's see. That started with dull horses. Let's, let's flip over to uh, the anxious horses, let's say. Yeah. I would say there's horses that I think everyone would easily call anxious. Uh, let's, you can envision the, uh, an Arabian with its tail in the air snorting. It just got off the trailer. Like, obviously that would be categorized as an anxious horse. Um, sometimes though, I think there are horses that are a little less, uh, expressive physically. But they are, I often end up calling them vigilant. Do I still think it's really just, Ugh. yeah, it is. But I'll, but I often call them vigilant because they're very stationary or, you know, comparatively anyway, very stationary. Maybe they, they can't stand truly still. I think that's usually true. They can't truly stand still and focus on you. Uh, if you try to break it down that way, but they don't go flying around like some, like another type of horse, you know, I think those horses um can be tricky because you know that's one of those things where the horse looks quiet to some people but if you start to say well are they engaging with me like they won't look at you for long they'll look, mm -hmm. they'll look at you easily probably but they cannot stay there and i don't expect a horse to just sit there and stare at me that's not reasonable or healthy <laughs> um but I do want them to be able to sit there for a minute and you start to see those horses, even though they're not moving all over the place, they are just like, doo, 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 doo. and then the nervous system is stuck in sympathetic. They, they don't feel, even though they're not uh wahoo, they don't feel safe enough to truly relax. And I think that can be another kind of, uh, Another kind of tricky, anxious horse, you know, and that would get a good example of what I mean when, in a way, the anxious horse that's honest about it and kind of let it yeah. lose around to me at this point is easier. I can help that horse yeah. back down. Whereas before in my previous life, I only knew like restraint tactics. Well, that didn't actually make the horse feel better. Now that I know how to make the horse feel better, it's easy to calm that horse down relatively. You know, turning it into some, you know, going back to work is another story, but getting it to calm down is usually quite easy uh, compared to the horse that is relatively stoic, relatively still, but just not maybe frozen. Like I just thought, you know, there's fight, freeze, 
I'm sorry, fight, fight or flight, freeze, fawn, people pleasing. Um, but, but personally, I would personally uh, say fr when they're frozen, yeah, are so active. To me, yeah, <laughs> okay, yeah, yeah, going elsewhere, and their eyes are yeah. so active. This is the horse yes. that you can notice if you start to look at it this way is always watching its surrounding. Uh, and that's that's, that's like the vigilance, you know. It, the, yes, it is a little different. I feel like now that horse, if you correct it enough without actually making it feel better or making it feel safer, but you just keep correcting it, that's the worst that I think does turn into freeze. They just, they just... Gotcha. Gotcha. Uh, well, yeah, that, that, you know, you, you said it from the beginning, this is a vigilant horse. So they're, so they're on guard in a sense, but it, but it can be very um, quiet in a, in, in a way, again, that's a way, you know, that's, that's how horses do protect themselves to a degree is by blending in and, um, you know, they're prey animals. So they, they're not, um, inclined to just show you, uh, if they're in discomfort or hurting. Um, but you know, there can be, I think, um, different things you expect from different breeds, right? Like you said, like an Arab or thoroughbred, they're going to be more honest, if you will, in their expression. Um, quarter horses, for instance, they're almost bred to work despite themselves. If that makes sense, they can be very obedient. They can tolerate a lot. Um, exactly what I say about the warm bloods I used to ride. Ah, I got it. Now, now yeah. I know some people will say dumb bloods. Oh, are, they're not the same. Yeah, the nice nice. that are not the same about them. I do think the quarter horses mature a lot faster, so that has something to do with it. Right? Sure. Yeah. You can take a mature warm blood and a mature quarter horse. While different, I think they are both often very tolerant. Uh, despite <laughs> they can take a lot. Let's put it that way. That's right. Yeah, yeah. both been bred uh, extensively. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. Well, and like what you're saying also makes me think about, I'm really sitting here going, when I first work on a horse, I think I, if the horse allows me to, sometimes the horse is um, too busy and, and they can't stand still. So maybe we just work on that, right? Like, like you have to have access to the horse, right? I think that's like what you're trying to get when you're first and me too. But I feel like if I really think about it, many times when I work on a horse, um, I go to that hind end and I get that sacrum and pelvis moving. I get those SIs moving. And that right there gets them in a more parasympathetic state. And then I do think I tend to like to get the structure moving that first time. Like really, like if it's a horse that we're we're wanting to make some changes on positive changes. I think when I reflect, I like to go in and go big. All right, well, we're, we're going to get some stuff moving. And usually when I get that hind in, then, then I can, you know, go through the rest of the body and it's usually the head and the jaws and the neck that at the end of the day are going to be the most defensive areas on a horse to work on. Um, sometimes you, you, that may not be the case. Maybe sometimes they're kicky behind. Well, then obviously I'm going to start somewhere else or I'm just not going to work on that horse. I'm not going to work on a horse that's going to hurt me. Um, right. Then I go, it's not my job to, to, to train the horse or it's not my job to be the vet and say, yep, we've got a real problem here that causes this horse to be dangerous. But, you know, most of the horses I work on, if I go in and I kind of, like I said, start in the hind end, or I can directly get to that parasympathetic system because that's where you have what they call secondary centers of your parasympathetic and that sacrum area about S2 to S4. Those horses usually, then I can go through all the spine, go through the forelimbs, head, neck, jaws, all the cranial structures. And then the next time I come, that horse knows me. Mm -hmm. it, it usually works like that. So, um, I think that, yeah, like we're both talking about access, um, but it's all about getting that horse to in that window of tolerance, mm -hmm. right? So that 
you can have access, but you can also do some things to to either remove tensions and restrictions, or in your case, you're just trying to get them to feel their body and use their body better. And that's why, you know, what we both do works so well together. Um, you know, those really difficult horses I have, um, like like Barnaby, we talked about your horse Barnaby. He was tough to work on at first. The first time I remember working on him because he was very protective of head, pole, and jaws. And you just, in that instance, you just kind of have to run with it. Like Jim Masterson will say that. If you have a horse that's a little bit anxious, dancing around, you know, you're obviously you're trying to relax them to where you can have a participation, right? But some horses, because of where they're at, they're going to constantly be kind of looky or watchy or moving around a lot. And yes, you're trying to relax them, but on the other hand, you just got to go with it. You just got to go with it because you, if you step away and give them time to process, they're just going to start fussing again. So he kind of calls it working on the run. So, you know, I do have those horses, but I have to say that when you get in there and you really get those things moving that affect that nervous system like that hind end, that horse comes down. And then I, I'm always amazed when I come back a second time. That horse remembers. It's so cool. And then we can start to kind of unpeel some other layers, right? And then hopefully they have someone like you that can move them in a way that also feels good. And then they, they can move parts of the body that weren't moving before. And 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 sometimes that hurts too to move to move correctly because you've got these things in the body. So if you can take those away, you're moving them correctly. Not only do they connect with their body, but it feels good. Yeah, I think uh, you used uh, you were using the word tolerance, and I think on like you know you're more of a uh, medical side of things. I think everyone expects to have to have some kind of tolerance when having a treatment. You know, yeah. certainly on the training side of things, I think there's kind of a sector of people that can like hear like I want to you know. I don't want my horse to just tolerate me. Of course, I think that's true. I want more than just tolerance. However, right. um, I think on the training side of things, you have like a spectrum of people. There's the people who like, they don't realize how much their horse tolerates from them. <laughs> right. Kate, right. They're just kind my of- My horse would probably raise her hook on that one. They're like, hey, I just tolerated but that he- chick for me. Never <laughs> long. <laughs> And then I think there's the other side of things that's getting like more and more common. In some ways, it's a good thing. In some ways, I think it's hard is like the people who like it's a hundred percent horse permission based. Now, I think, you know, where I'm going with that. Like, yes, of course, on a nervous system level, I need them to be accessible and be in a learning state of mind. But I also know that there has to be, I have to have the ability for me to say like, hey, horse, like tolerate me a minute. There's my air quotes again, by the way, in case you're just listening. Yeah, I want more than my horse to tolerate, but we're going to use that. Of course, tolerate me. I know this is hard or I know this is uncomfortable, but like, just trust me, there's something on the other side of this, you know, and you need, I think, a way to say that uh, i talked about this once before on the, tr- on the positive reinforcement side of things you can use that to help you you just have to be very careful that it's not the only way because next thing you know your horse can only do easy stuff they can't tolerate anything hard and at the end of the day yeah we all know for medical reasons or for the farrier sometimes they have to tolerate something but on the training side of things too, and that's not just because you're using a horse or abusing a horse or, you know, I think some people don't build any tolerance into their horse at all on a handling perspective. And the, it's, uh, let's just say you need tolerance built in there and it's not just for the vet, you know, it's like you truly will have a better, happier horse if they can tolerate some stuff, because sometimes it's for their greater good. It's not just for us, you know? Exactly. 
Right. I mean, that's so funny. So I'll read. No, I I love that you brought that up because what what I find is that, of course, anybody's gonna be any you, me, the horse, a dog, a cat. They're gonna be protective of areas that carry tension. But for me to really um, help them feel better, I have to get there. Right. So I do, I do really appreciate what you said because I think you can swing extreme in this way and go, well, the horse doesn't like it. So I'm not going to do it. And then we're not going there to help the horse. I mean, I have a, I have um, a really good friend on the East Coast who is literally the best dentist I've ever worked with. And she's an osteopath too. And we've been talking about that lately because, you know, sometimes these horses that she needs to go in and really help, they're, they're very painful in their mouths, either maybe an area where they're ulcerating or um, the palate. Um, there's a lot of, you know, sensitivity inside the mouth, you know, so are you going to say, you know, the horse doesn't like it. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to go there. Or do you say, Hey, veterinarian, do you mind giving this horse some sedation so that I can go in and really get to the problem, you know, and those are the changes that dentists, uh, osteopaths can make. Sometimes that horse is just too painful and you say, Hey, vet, can you give a little sedation? You go in, you address that issue. And oh my goodness, I have seen it time and time and time again, how it's miraculous how these horses change. But if you are too afraid to go there because the horse doesn't like it, we're missing an opportunity to address the biggest source of their pain or discomfort. Or maybe it's a mental block, for instance, what you're dealing with. Um, but I love that you said that. And also I find too, that in handling the horse, like it's lovely when I have you, for instance, to hold the horse for me. And, and most horse owners are, are really good. You know, I just look at them and I go, okay, pretend you're a tree that the horse is tied to, you know, if you don't mind, don't, you know, try not to pet him too much. It's too much stimulation if I'm doing this and you're doing this. Um, but what I find sometimes is, uh, the, the owner may, may allow that horse to move kind of more than, than they need to, for me to do what I need to do. Or maybe the horse, for instance, wants to kind of run over me. And I just go, no, take a step back. Like there's, I'm not trying to train the horse, but there's like a dance, right? That goes on when you're working with them. And it's very nuanced and it's not one way or the other. It's a, it's a participation and it's like, okay, I'm trying to help you. So I need you to help me. And you just make these little minute kind of actions throughout like i said if they throw a shoulder into you or they take a step okay or you know yeah I, i'm listening to you i know that you're really protective about this area i've been doing this enough to know when i'm escalating and they're gonna kick me or i just go you're fine let's just let's just keep let's just keep at it because like you said on the other end it's gonna feel a lot better there's so much nuance and experience that comes into what we both do on reading the horse, we have to get access. Um, we have to be able to engage with that horse, but it depends on the individual horse. And it takes that kind of wisdom, I think, that you accumulate just from doing something for forever, but wanting to grow in it, that allows you to be that, um, uh, be that dancer, be that partner in that dance. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, um, definitely a conversation. I mean, I call it conversation law. It's definitely a conversation. And like, it's so challenging if someone wants to, they want to learn a thing that they saw me do or whatever. And it's like, but that thing wouldn't work if I hadn't had this like 15 back and forth questions, let's say, obviously it's not exactly like that, but you get what I mean. Like, oh, totally. That only worked then and there because of all these other back and forths that happened. And then it's like, that was possible then. But even me, it's not like I could just walk up and start the conversation totally differently and get that same results. 
you know it's like it's a it's a back and forth see seeing where we're at seeing uh seeing what happens when i do this how about you try that if the horse feels you having that kind of conversation i think they start to become more receptive to totally around totally the domineering this is the way we do it do it the, 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 you know like there's a time and a place for structure and certainly boundaries and things like that but if the horse doesn't feel well like warwick schiller would say uh the horse has to be has to feel seen uh you know they, they do they, they have to feel like they're a participant in order to have that kind of uh vulnerable conversation with you whether it's physical or mental because as we know they're all connected so and i feel like with the horse it's always intimate yeah. that you know that communication is always intimate if you're gonna get anywhere it has to be you know some horses i think are a little uh that to me is a shutdown horse a horse that like can't have any kind of feely conversation with someone they forgot what it's like to even be handled like that. yeah no i'm sure you run into that where like you Sometimes, sometimes you first see a horse and they're like not there, and then it doesn't take that much, but just a few little back and forth, and they're like, "Oh, oh hi, yeah, hello," and when, and <laughs> but then you have to tell the owner, you have to say, "Well, the horse may wake up. See, that happens too sometimes, yeah. right? Yeah. So be, you know, be be aware, and yeah, like I I I know you see that too. Like you you start to pull that horse out of their defense mm -hmm. um and maybe they were a, a very shut down horse still having that anxiety or that fear but very internalized and you start to pull and um they may fuck they may you know they they may do some things you're not ready for yeah because there's a lot we were talking about the uh, vigilant horses. Sometimes that's not to say this is like some squirrely animal. It's very often a good horse, you know, a brave horse. People would say, I can ride that horse off alone. I can do all this stuff. And the reason you can is because that horse is holding it for you. They're kind of holding it together, I think that horse would say, uh, which is not a bad thing as long as it's balanced out and, uh, cared for let's say because that's a really good feature in a horse but it can certainly be abused that that feature <laughs> but i think either way even when it's not being abused that horse can benefit from in a safe situation learning to relax deeper you know i think we all can we can all benefit well y'all can but i just love i i've never thought of of that type of like the vigilant horse or the vigilant response that you have so much nuance that you bring to the table. So I just love all these. I love that you're not putting horses in a box, right? Like they really are an individual and, and you work with that. So you really are, you're a horse therapist too. Often. Yeah. I have to create a certification so I can put some letters behind my name. Oh my gosh, yes. I went to your class. I'm going to make sure that I come up with a really long name so that my one certification has like at least five letters. The well, you have, you have, to, and I'm the first to sign up. I love it. Oh man. Between certifications and, uh, courses, online courses, man, those are my two favorite things. Can't There's a lot of options out there. <laughs> yes. Anyway, we better hear this before I get. Okay. Say something. But I think this was a very good discussion. Yeah, that was great. Very good. Yes, can't wait. Thank to you. Do it again. We'll talk to you. We will. We will do it again. Watch out, people. We're doing it again. Doing it again. Just yeah. Me. All right. Thank you, right. everyone. Okay. Bye. Bye. Thank you for joining us. If you have questions or comments about the show. Or if you have something you would like us to discuss on a future episode, we'd love to hear from you. And as always, if you enjoyed the show, please share. Vanessa and I really appreciate your support. We will see you next time. Okay.